Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Sam's Report. Today is November 11th. It's actually a holiday. Today is Veterans Day, so I know a lot of people are off work. Uh, my wife being one of them. Obviously I'm doing the podcast, so I am not, but I don't really consider this work. I, I really do enjoy uh, every aspect of this and hopefully it comes across that way because it's a lot of fun. So today is Friday. It's time to do a podcast and let's dive in. So one of the things announced this week, and I love Skype to death because this is the, they do these things all the time. All the time Skype does this. They announced an in, insiders program. Now, you might be thinking, ah, what, what's the big deal about that? So <laughs> Skype, being in the fact that they screw up most things, called it insiders with an S on the end. Every other program inside of Microsoft is insider. It's Windows insider. Uh, it's Office insider. It's Xbox insider. But Skype, Skype put an extra S on the end because that's what Skype does. They get, they get most of the details right, but they never quite fully get everything correct. So good job, Skype. Skype Insiders program is now out there. Um, and I don't know who the hell would want to run this. <laughs> well, mostly because we know Skype has had its fair share of issues, right? Um, things just not working, messaging not coming in, incorrect syncing, or my personal favorite, that the browser tab continues to ring even if you answer it with a desktop client. So if you really like driving yourself nuts and want to work on Skype platforms that are either potentially more broken, uh, there's now an insiders program for you. So I, I maybe I shouldn't be as tough on them as I have been, but at the end of the day, sometimes love has to be a little tough. Um, and maybe these new preview builds will iron things out. I don't know. My, my biggest problem is, is that I use Skype for a lot of things. When we, Paul and I podcast every day, we use Skype and I use it for work and I use it for, actually, I use it for phone calls too, outbound phone calls. So if I ever have a conference call, um, I don't use my cell phone. I use Skype. I got a bunch of Skype credits. It's a great way to dial out. And so to use something that's potentially even more unstable than Skype, uh, Skype release makes me a little bit nervous, but if you like truly living on the bleeding edge and you're in the insider program and you're in the office insider program and you're in the Xbox insider program and you just don't like your stuff to be stable, there's another option for you. Now, granted, hopefully this should help improve the quality. Uh, I, I have some of my doubts because it seems like Skype has been a little dense about being receptive to feedback, but you know what? Here we are. They've got an insider program. And let's just hope that it makes things a little bit better. So uh, that is now out. You can go enroll. It's open to anybody. And <clears throat> that's that's Skype. I, whatever. Skype is Skype. So here's here's what I really wanted to talk about. And I'm actually very pumped that this finally came out. So if you jump back into the spring, uh, before uh, before Xbox, before E3, before E3, I did a podcast. It's actually been the lar one of the largest podcasts I've ever done for the Sam's Report, that is. And I had a, a huge dump of data about what Microsoft was going to be announcing that year. And I got, you know, the Xbox Mini, uh, which was the Xbox One S. And I got it with a new controller. I got it in white. I got that they were bringing more features to uh, the Xbox app um, with streaming and Windows 10 support and integration and some other fun stuff in there. But the one thing that people latched onto that I, you know, I missed, or that I should say was not announced, was an Xbox streamer. And I was the only one who had this information, and there was just nothing. And granted, I'll admit, I was a little bit nervous when it didn't come out. I was like, ah, crap. And then all of a sudden, nobody was saying anything about it. And lo and behold, here we are in November, and finally, a, a completely independent report came out verifying just about all the information that I said. And so let's talk about it. It actually came from Windows Central, and they were able to talk to somebody, obviously, off the record, and they shouldn't, you know, leaks and whatnot. And they talked about the media streamer. It did exist. It was codenamed Hobart, which I do know for a fact is correct. I have that name still in my notes. Um, there might have been another one. I, I don't know if some of the lines were crossed on the information that arrived, but there was at least one called Hobart looking for a price around 100 bucks, and it was going to be an Xbox media streamer, and it would have the ability to run lightweight UWP apps up on a screen much like the one behind me, and it would have filled the gap that Microsoft had in its uh, consumer marketplace, right? They have a console, they have uh, desktop software, they have the ability to stream stuff. We know that because you can do it from the Xbox to... Uh, your PC, but you can't do it from an Xbox to an external display other than, you know, through an HDMI cable. And so we know this thing um, now did exist. Supposedly, they were going to order 300,000 of these things for delivery not long after E3. But the the word 
on the street is that Microsoft got a little spooked at E3 when word of a PlayStation Pro was going to be announced. And so they said, crap, we got to do Scorpio. So they kind of rushed everything up and they did Scorpio and the Xbox One S. And I completely believe this too. Mostly because if you look at the way the Xbox One S was announced, it's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, it's a complete redesign. It looks fantastic. And what did Microsoft do? They shoved it right at the front of the keynote. Typically, you put like your large console uh, related hardware announcements at the end. And they did this right up front, which tells me that they said, hey, we're just going to cut this from the end of the keynote and put it at the front. And we're going to talk about Scorpio. And so then they put Scorpio at the end. And the whole messaging, I, I said this many times, is very confusing because they said, hey, look, here's our brand new Xbox One S console. But... Um, you know what? We're going to have another one next year. So eh, we're just going to announce two consoles for the price of one. It never really made sense. So I completely believe that that is accurate. Um, Hobart is the device that never materialized. <clears throat> I still hold hope that maybe we'll see it one day because I still believe that they're, they are missing that media streamer component from the consumer lineup. Uh, although there's been a lot of people raising questions saying, hey, does Microsoft truly care about the consumer? I still think they do. But that is one very large gap um, in the marketplace besides, I don't know if this will pull all the way over, besides one of these guys. This is an Amazon Echo. And so they don't have a competitor with that either. So those are the two big core missing components from Microsoft's lineup at this time. But Kumbaya, here we are, no streamer, but we do know it exists. Hobart, Hobart, H-O-B-A-R-T was the name of that, the code name of that device, I should say. That was the code name. So... Microsoft, we can put that in the bin with the Surface Mini, the McLaren, um, yeah, a whole bunch of other things. So we will see. Hey, this phone actually turned back on. I was having some trouble charging this. We'll talk about it here in a minute. But that's the streamer. Come on, Microsoft, give it to us. Ooh, I forgot hitting the desk. We'll shake the camera. Uh, good job, Brad. But that is the missing component. Hmm. I hope we see it. I really, truly do, because I would actually buy one. Every time I bring this up to Microsoft, they say, hey, just use our other streamer that's 50 bucks and just plug it in. And to be honest, guys, it just doesn't work the same. And I like the idea of being able to run UWP apps remotely on that device, independent of my PC, especially on a screen like that. Uh, I really would have liked that. I really would have liked that. Come on, Microsoft. You can still do this. There's still time. Maybe they can bundle it in. I'm not really holding any my breath for this one but that we do know that they're going to likely have a spring hardware event uh where they will announce the surface book 2 and the pro 5 uh likely i, I wonder if it's going to be related to around the time of the creators update that would seem to make a lot of sense and um <clears throat> i don't know i don't know if they're going to do it then i guess they potentially still could to make a, a huge event but we will see uh, other things announced this week, Microsoft pushed out a new build of Windows 10, 14965, and there's really only one thing you need to know about this, which is actually pretty cool. There is now a feature in Windows 10 that's a virtual touchpad, and so you can pull it up on the display, and it lets you use it like a mouse with an external display. Now, you might be wondering, what is this useful for? This is what it is. If you have a tablet that has an external display, um, or potentially even in touch mode, I guess this could work too, you can now use that virtual trackpad to control a mouse on another display when connected to a tablet. It's actually just kind of a nice little feature. That way, um, if you're using that external display and you can't actually tap on it, use the mouse. Uh, the other thing where this could be convenient is if you're actually using a tablet and there's really small tap targets because it's not optimized for your finger, you can then use that touchpad to scroll around and get that hit that little target. So it's a virtual trackpad. It's nothing crazy, mind-blowing or whatever, but that's kind of the big feature along with, um, actually, I don't know if they were doing the, the new update mechanisms on phones yet with that. I should probably look into that. But uh, that's the UUP, is that what they call it? Um, anyways, so that's what's new in that release. You can go grab it now, fast ring only. We don't know if it's coming to slow ring. Uh, we don't know if this build, we won't know for a while. Microsoft's um, slow for getting things to the slow ring. But anyways, that's out. Go grab it and do whatever. So I want to talk about here now that it's embargo broken and now that it's actually charging. So uh, you can't really see it in this view. Let me... So this phone right here is the Alcatel Idol 4S. And I have it on the charger. I actually had it on the charger all night and it didn't seem to charge. But it looks like it's now working correctly. 
Uh, since you restarted, oop, got to use your pen. Um, let's just do that back here. <laughs> it's the same pen I use on a lot of things. There we go. Um, so this is the phone. You can see it here. Um, nothing crazy. I mean, I showed it off last time. Nice metal exterior camera on the back. And you can actually hear it. It's probably easier if I swap the cameras. Um, you can see there with all my fingerprints, the fingerprint reader, the fingerprint reader, to be honest, is not working all that well. Um, it, it does work, but it's, it's, as you can see, yeah, you can see here it failed again. So I, I've set it up with multiple fingers. It works infrequently at best, but um, other things, this is, it, it's just an okay phone. It, it's not great, but it's honestly not bad. So if you have, if you're diehard Windows fan and you have a Lumia 950, uh, this is a good upgrade. This is a, this is a good upgrade. Although it, you'll miss some of the, the Windows Hello does work better on the Microsoft phone. Uh, larger display, nice metal exterior. It, it honestly feels better than the 952 because the 950 has got this plasticky crap on it. I don't, I've never really liked the uh, polycarbonate as Microsoft slash Nokia called it. It's plastic, guys. So you got a nice metal band exterior. The camera is, it gets, it's fine in good light. Low light, it suffers a little bit. Performance is absolutely fine. Um, no issues there. Shutter speed is, is fine. Browsing the web, it's Windows Phone, right guys? It, it's, you know what you're getting with a, a Windows Phone. Lack of apps. Um, third party apps just for making up for first party like Twitter uh, do work well. But, you know, if you need an update, this is, this is probably your, your best bet. I don't know if you want to go all the way crazy and go to the uh, HP phone because that's quite a bit more money. And this is available on T-Mobile today. And so if you're looking for a new Windows phone, I think it's a good upgrade. If you're looking for a first smartphone for somebody, like if your parents need a new smartphone, that's a little bit tougher of a sell. So uh, especially because you can get Androids. Jeez, man, the I, the fingerprint reader is the demise of this thing, at least for me. And uh, I, I used to make Skype calls. I carried it around for a couple days. That's why the battery was actually dead. And so there you go. Uh, Alcatel Idol 4S, now available on T-Mobile. It's, it's a good Windows phone device. It's not a great um, high-end smartphone. It's not, it's not pitched to be a high-end smartphone. So that's potentially not fair of a, of a criticism. But... There you go. If you're looking for a new phone, check it out on T-Mobile. You can get it today. And um, if you're a Windows Phone fan, it's a good phone for that ecosystem. I, I will I will say that. If you're a Windows Phone fan, this is a good phone to get. Somebody actually asked if they should buy... Ooh, almost dropped it. If they should buy this or wait for the Surface Phone. Do not... Look, please, guys. Do not wait for the Surface Phone. We don't know when this thing is going to materialize, if it's going to materialize. you got to remember, when Microsoft likes to release devices, let's, let's talk about it. So Surface Book, which we'll talk about here in a minute, is a two devices, right? It's a laptop and a tablet. The Surface Studio is an all-in-one, and it's also a drafting board. It, it, it has to have two functions. So what's the Surface phone going to have? It's going to have, uh, it's going to be a phone, and then it's going to have Continuum, but they need to kind of make it that surface -y thing, that, that thing that HP doesn't do, that thing that um, isn't easily replicated by its partners. So just, I, I would not be holding my breath for a Surface phone, um, Rumors keep saying 2017, 2018. Nobody really knows at this point. And I don't, I don't have any information about when it's coming out. I don't even know if Microsoft actually knows uh, when this phone is coming out. So that is the idle Alcatel 4S. Oh, I completely forgot. The virtual reality. We talked about that last week. It, it works. You come... Uh, where did I put the headset? I don't know where the headset is right now. Uh, actually, I do know it's upstairs. We were using it upstairs last night. Um, <clears throat> the, the virtual reality does work. But again, it's... It, it has some room for improvement. It has some ways to go. If you've never done VR, then sure, it's kind of neat and fun, but it's not something you're going to lust for after about an hour of use. It's, it's okay. It's an average experience. There's not a lot of great content, and that's not just a knock on uh, like Windows Phone or whatever. That's really across the entire gamut. There's not a lot of great VR content yet, that it is more compelling to use on a VR scenario than just say on a desktop or even just on a phone, just looking around. They're still, they have the solution. They're still looking for that killer thing um, that makes that makes slapping a phone and, and walking around goofy like 
absolutely essential. I I like VR and I like AR, but it, I still think we have a solution and we're looking for a problem. Now, in the enterprise space, I think there are more problems that this does solve, like the, the elevator scenario and schematics when you're looking at that stuff. But I'm talking about strictly from a consumer experience. Like, it's great to... Like, people love this stuff that you can put it on and you can go, go sit in Italy and, like, look around and it, you, and you feel like you're there. And I guess for some people that's great, but um, you really lack the immersion still with this stuff. So, anyways, you do get that headset. It does come with it. It's no extra charge and it works. And it comes with a couple games, uh, a VR shooter or a zombie shooter. Um, then there's some, like, 3D videos and all that good stuff. But at the end of the day... Uh, if you've ever used any VR, it has the exact same problem where you can kind of see it's grainy on your uh, up and on the tops and the bottoms on your peripheral vision. And so it's that experience is extrapolated exponentially with these low end VR experiences. Even my Vive had that same problem. So if you've never used VR, it's it's neat, but it's not essential, I think is, is the best way to describe it at this point. So. That is this phone. Go grab it if that's your thing. If not, don't. So anyways, I want to talk about lots of review stuff. I want to talk about this bad boy. This bad boy. And it looks just like all the other bad boys that I have sitting on my desk. Uh, but this is, well, this is the Surface Pen that it comes with. This is the Surface Book with Performance Base. And you can kind of see, let me see if I can get there you go. That's actually a really good look. You can see that extra kind of little hump in there. Uh, let me get the non-performance base and put it next to it. So you can kind of see that hump. And on the other one, there is no hump. That hump is your extra batteries. That's what it is. And so at the bottom here, it's uh, a little bit thicker still. You can kind of see. But this is the performance base. And so it is heavier. It is better. It is bigger. It is quite literally bigger and better and faster in every way, right? So you get uh, an upgraded graphics chip, which is roughly twice as good as the old one. It's not quite like, twice as good as probably. I'd put it like one and a half, 1.8 times better than what was in the old uh, dual GPU version. You get battery life. Microsoft claims up to 16 hours. I was getting around 10 hours with this thing. So let me see if I can just pop this off because it's a little bit easier to... To look at. I was getting around 10 hours, and that's, granted, that's under heavy use. So this is, I mean, same connector up top. Really nothing has changed uh, from that standpoint. You can see that the, the vent holes are quite a bit thicker. I actually am more concerned about stuff getting in there on this version than the other. But uh, 16 hours batteries, I'm getting closer to 10, a little about 10 and a half. Now, granted, that is under very heavy use. That's me using it. We actually, some of the podcasts last week that I did with Paul uh, were hosted off of this machine. I was just testing it out to see if it would work. So it, it does work. Um, it, and you do get better battery life compared to the old one. The biggest honest downside of this thing is, granted, it, it is expensive. $23.99 is the starting price. The biggest downside of this is that these displays are swappable. And you can take a Surface Book display, any Surface Book display, and put it on the performance base and get that additional benefit. But Microsoft is not going to be selling it. Um, I, I asked very clearly, I said, hey, Microsoft, are you going to let us live the dream of a modular modular uh, laptop, right? So you'd have a display and a base, and you can swap these things. And right now, they're not going to sell it, which I honestly think is very disappointing, Um there's a couple caveats, and I know I've talked about what this actually wrote it up. And so the caveats here are, from Microsoft standpoint, why they would not do this. This is my speculation. One, the base might be very expensive. If the base cost seven, eight hundred bucks, would people really buy it? Uh, I, I don't think it's cheap. I would imagine if this base was like three to four hundred bucks, I think they would be selling it. But I would imagine it's very expensive. Uh, two, I, I don't know the actual size of the market of people that would be willing to buy this. I honestly think there is some market though. Like imagine if you bought the i5 version without the dual GPU and a year and a half goes by and you say, you know what? I want to get some more horsepower and better batteries. So you just go buy the base for six, 700 bucks. Um, so I do think there is some market from that aspect. Uh, I think Microsoft might be worried that they would build too many and never sell them. I don't know. Microsoft has a very, 
cautious approach towards building out inventory ever ever since they built the Surface RT where they had a $900 million write down. Ever since then, they've been very cautious. Even with the Surface Hub, uh, they were they kind of underbid the market. Um, we know the Surface Studio uh, is very limited supply. And so maybe that's part of it. But it, this is a good machine. Like if you're looking for a high-end laptop, this is this has to be on your list. I know 2300 bucks is not cheap and it's not the laptop for everybody. But if you were looking for, in my opinion, the device that shows off Windows 10 at its best, it's probably this. And that's granted, that's exactly why they built Surface. The reason why they built the Surface Studio is to show off the pen on a desktop in that environment. I think the Surface Book embodies what Windows 10 is expected to be. And this does all that well and gives you extra battery life. And you could do some light gaming. I would not buy this in replacement of a gaming laptop. Um, you know, there's some of those big 17 inch things that are a half inch thick that have uh, desktop class GPUs in them and um, desktop class uh, chips. But yeah, so 2300 bucks. I really like this machine. I The extra battery life just kind of puts it over the top for me. A lot of companies promise massive battery life. Apple is actually generally okay with it, but a lot of PC vendors, they know they're competing head to head with other laptops and they say, hey, this is the, the battery life that you get. And it's never really quite accurate. And e even Microsoft at 16 hours, granted I could get much closer to 16 hours if all I was doing was light work, like web browsing and email and probably just writing. Uh, in general, I probably could have gotten closer to that 16 hours. I, I will fully admit that. But even at 10 hours, really using this thing as a workhorse, fantastic. And the lost opportunity here is that, unfortunately, for anybody else, uh, you can't just swap bases. I mean, I'm lucky that I have two, I actually have three bases here that I can just swap them around. It's essentially an external battery at this point. But Microsoft is not letting you live that dream of truly having... Uh, an external battery. That's because this is what frustrates me. The thing that typically kills a laptop, especially these days, is not necessarily that it's slow. It, it, on a laptop, the battery typically is the first thing to go flat that ruins kind of the laptop experience, right? Because a battery degrades much faster than the performance does on a modern Intel chip. And so with the Surface Book, what would have been nice is that you can just replace the batteries. Not Granted, you can't replace the batteries in the uh, lid, but... For most, for most, the, the significant portion of the battery is actually in the base. And so if you could swap that out and give your $1,500 laptop a nice little $500 boost and let you keep it another two years because the batteries are now fine, that's the dream of the laptop. And Microsoft isn't quite there. Maybe one day we'll get there. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they're worried that because the Surface Book 2 has a different hinge mechanism and so the bases would not be compatible and so they're waiting until that arrives to, to truly let you do this and that's the reason. But at the same time, it, that feels a little odd because then why would they come out with this brand new... I don't know. I don't know. Microsoft, throw me a bone. Throw us a bone. Let us know why why you're not allowing us to do that. So, uh, if you do want a Surface Book with a Surface Base, you can, they're now available in the stores. I believe the Surface Dial is as well. So that is out there and go grab them if that's your thing. I don't know what the actual availability in terms of quantity, they, they told us the studio was in limited supply. I don't know if that's true for the base. I would imagine because it's super, uh, that, that higher premium and laptop, that it's a limited, you know, less than um, the typical. But there you go. If you do want a Surface Book, I believe they start around fourteen hundred bucks. But be on the lookout for deals. Microsoft is constantly running like a hundred dollars, hundred dollars, or hundred fifty dollars off certain models. So kind of keep yourself on the lookout for that. Uh, speaking of Surface, by the way, Microsoft claims they promised finally this time, actually for real, fix the Surface Pro Three battery. This is the not the Simplo issue, but the other battery issue that pro cropped up. Microsoft. Uh, yeah, saying, hey, it really is this fixed this time. Please run a firmware update and you will get more battery life out of your device for now. Uh, that is out there. Other cool thing, a cool thing if you want to call it that, Microsoft is actually refunding customers who paid for out-of-warranty service charges to their batteries. So if you actually took in your Surface Pro 3 and said, hey, my battery's flat, and they get, I think they were charging 500 bucks to swap that thing out, uh, Microsoft is actually refunding that money. I don't think they're take, making you force you to put your old battery back in, but they are actually doing that. So 
Uh, other things on the Windows Phone side. Actually, this was a pretty big deal. So uh, early in the week, EV Leaks, uh, Evan Bass posted up a picture of a high-end Windows Phone and gave the hint that it would have an Intel chip inside. And so after talking with people familiar with the situation, they said, hey, that's actually a Dell phone. And so I wrote up and said, hey, here's what Dell's look at the potential future was like. And because everybody thought this was the Surface phone. It, it, it's not the Surface phone. It's a Dell device. I, I knew that uh, from the get-go. And then so Evan actually wrote up more information about it. And he's like, yeah, it actually is a Dell phone. It was expected to use Cabby Lake. But as of right now, we don't think this thing is going to materialize. Uh, mostly because the product has already morphed. As you can imagine, putting it was roughly the same thickness as roughly about an iPhone, give or take, or probably actually a little bit thicker or closer to something like this. You can imagine putting an Intel chip in something this thin. It's a thermal nightmare is what it is. Intel has never been good at scaling down these desktop class chips to put them in a mobile situation to where the cooling can be done passively without a fan. Now, I know somebody's going to write in and say, well, Brad, there's a Surface Pro that has one without fan in it. But there's a lot more space in there, and they can do some fun things with cooling. When you have a closed compartment, you got to remember, most of these phones, for the not completely, but are sealed compartments, right? Even the iPhone. We know the iPhone's water-resistant, so it is sealed. So a lot of these phones are actually completely sealed, which means no airflow. And if you have no airflow, that, that passive cooling that the Intel chips need... Uh, doesn't exist so maybe they could have done something with their liquid cooling um, not this one the 950 i think xl has the liquid cooling kind of mechanism built in so um i i it was a cabby lake chip so there there's two thoughts the cabby lake we know is still alive but i believe my intel has killed off a lot of their atom chips and i don't know if they killed off their atom chip that was based on cabby lake which was the device the chip that was expected to be pushed in um Dell, you know, uh, take it, taking a step back, this is this is good stuff at the end of the day. If you're a Windows Phone fan, actually, to be honest, probably for Microsoft too, because let's think about it. You have you had HP thinking outside the box with their Elite uh, X3, and then you also have Dell looking at this, saying, "Hey, we understand where Windows is going. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but let's kind of start building products so that we can reach that that." scenario when it arrives with the technology and dell went the more ambitious route with an intel chip and we all know hp went the more or less ambitious route with an arm based chip with uh what is it streaming capabilities to run win 32 apps in the cloud so here's the question that i don't know um let's let's think about this for a second i honestly wonder if dell was building this phone alongside what microsoft was doing with the surface phone I, I wonder this. I, I really do. Like genuinely, because Microsoft, we know when they were building out the original Surface, they actually showed it to a bunch of their partners and said, hey, look, we're building this. And there was a lot of backlash and all that crap. But Microsoft, obviously, if they're building a Surface phone with an Intel chip, I could imagine them showing that to partners and saying, hey, um, you guys could try to build this too. And so if, if Dell truly killed theirs, I would imagine it was, potentially was off the back of Microsoft, who likely would have been funding the R&D to make this type of a device uh, capable and maybe this would have been more of a reference design when they were showing it off or potentially even announcing it. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I truly wonder if Microsoft was kind of pushing Dell and HP and then, then HP said, hey, that's not going to work. We're going to run with ARM and do our own thing. And Dell said, hey, that's not, you guys aren't moving quick enough to make this a reality. We're going to stop it. And Microsoft was like, you know what? This isn't going to work either. Um, it, the, the thermal component is just crazy. So really interesting stuff so if that's if that's where they're going we'll see um i hope the dream is not dead but for right now we don't know if this is going to be released the re the rumored uh release date actually so quasi interesting if you want to call it that was in the spring and we all know in the spring we have a couple things coming up we have the creators update is going to be released in the spring we believe surface book 2 and the pro 5 are coming in the spring likely in tandem with that update and so this device was actually supposed to be released in the spring as well. I wonder if it was all tied into Redstone 2, and that was going to be kind of how things were going to work. So, I don't know. Interesting times. Um, speaking of Redstone 2, anybody who's watched this show long enough knows that Redstone 3 already exists, uh, and Redstone 4, actually, the name exists. There was some people wrote up this week that, oh, Microsoft's already talking about Redstone 3, and there's Redstone 4. Yeah, these are just the next iterations. They're currently called Redstone. They could change them. 
uh, at any time. But Redstone 3 has been talked about. Uh, I mentioned it at least six, seven months ago. And you can imagine they're starting to plan out Redstone 4 because they're they're getting very close to with Redstone 2 of saying, okay, these are the features and they're going to eventually here, not quite yet, but they're going to put a, you know, the line in the sand and it's going to say, okay, these are all the things coming in Redstone 2. We're going to start pushing things into Redstone 3. Granted, we know a lot of the stuff that's coming already because they showed it off uh, earlier this month at the studio update. But anyways, that's Redstone 2 coming this spring and We'll see if the Dell's phone ever shows up. Other things that are going on this week, uh, Microsoft's Cash app, if you remember that, that's the OneNote um, <laughs> successor, as we all believe. Actually, we know it is because it uses <laughs> the OneNote name and some of the install files and some of the other documentation specifically calls it OneNote. Anyway, so Cash is now in a private beta. Uh, a couple of people said they found the invite in their junk mail. So go check your junk mail to see if you got invited, if you signed up for it. I have not. But it does come with an iOS app. I believe Android is out there, and there should be a UWP iteration of it as well, which means it should work on Windows Phone. So Cache is now in private beta. Go check it out. Uh, other things I got my hands on this week, Project Cheshire, Cheshire, I just like saying that, was updated. It's a to-do list app, and that is also in private beta as well. And so I don't... You can go read up on Cheshire all you want, but it's just really a minimalist to-do app. And that's it. There's not a whole lot to it. It, it seems very Wonderlist-like, so I don't know why it exists. But uh, Project Cheshire now in private beta. No idea when this is going to show up. I, I would imagine maybe it's a garage app. I, I haven't quite figured out what the intent of this product is other than to compete with uh, Wonderlist. Maybe, I mean, it's a very simplified version, and maybe that's kind of what they're going for. I, I don't know. Uh, other cool things that are now coming to the PC, Affinity Photo. This is an award-winning uh, Mac app. It's called Affinity Photo. It's a Photoshop-esque type competitor, and it's now coming to the PC. It's in beta. You can try it for free. This is actually a pretty big deal because there's a lot of people on Macs who say, you know what, I would come to Windows, back to Windows, but it has, there's certain apps that I can't because I'm, I'm using Affinity uh, Photo. And so now that is coming back. I believe there's another one called Sketch that is very heavily used on OS X that is not available yet on Windows. But seeing how the studio update is coming and the creator's update, uh, studio update, the studio uh, all-in-one and then the creator's update are kind of enabling this mentality. I do wonder if we're going to start to see some of those exclusive OS X apps making their way to Windows and trying to grab more market share. So especially when you have things like Xamarin and everything else that make it easier to build Windows apps and Mac apps at the same time. So I uh, want to give just one other quick update. I know I talked about, I, I love my Amazon Echo. Um, I did not get a Google Home, mostly because Microsoft didn't announce one. And what I wanted to do was have an Echo uh, Home and then whatever Microsoft called there is a Cortana Cube uh, all sitting there and I wanted to play with these things, but um, they're not here. But anyways, so working with some Sonos guys, uh, they Sonos and Amazon Echo are kind of like my dream. I listen to a ton of music, and one of the things I did was I got two Sonos Play 5s, and what you can do is there's a line in on the Play 5, and I got an Echo Dot, the little, like, it's quite literally just an Amazon Echo, but just like this top portion, there's none of this tube that gives you the, the higher quality speaker. And what it allows you to do is stream music throughout the house. So I can control all this stuff by voice. It works wonderfully, and I am in love uh, with it. So, yeah. So that's that. And, wow, we've actually gone over a half hour already. So that's typically about where I like to keep these things. I know we've gotten a lot of new readers and watchers lately. Uh, this show usually lasts 30 to 40 minutes, and we're coming up on 40 minutes, and I don't like to drag this on. So... I'm going to do, uh, see if there's any questions. I apologize, guys. Usually I get this thread up a lot earlier uh, in the week asking for questions, but we do have uh, a couple things. So da -da 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 -da. so if you weren't aware, uh, Paul is actually in Amsterdam right now. We actually already did our uh, first ring daily. It'll go up here in a little bit. And uh, Bart asked if I'm going to set his house on fire while he's in Europe. Um, no, I do need Paul around to do stuff. Um, da -da -da -da. What's the other question? Uh, so this is an interesting one. I try not to keep things too political, but uh, somebody says, do you think a Trump presidency will change how Microsoft works, especially with overseas businesses? Here's the thing. We don't have any idea what, anytime there's a political change, it doesn't matter if it would have been Clinton, doesn't matter if it had been Trump, doesn't matter if it would have been Jill Stein or Gary Johnson got into the presidency. A, a change in presidency 
always has impacts on everything. It doesn't matter if it's for the person you voted for or the person you voted against. It doesn't matter who got in there. There's always going to be unrest because nobody knows what their policies are until they're implemented and time goes by. So do I think it'll impact how Microsoft does overseas businesses? I don't quite know because here's why. Because Microsoft has put a big value on fighting the government. And that's not going to change, right? If the government wants data access to European stuff and Microsoft doesn't believe that's right, they're going to fight it. Microsoft doesn't roll over uh, to government requests. They've, they've proven this time and time again. That is not going to change with Microsoft. Um, they have also been pushing encryption and secure storage. And that is not going to change. Honestly, if I think anything else, uh, we're going to see more encryption and more storage. If that's any change, that's probably it. But I think that was on the roadmap anyways. So uh, I, I don't think we're going to see any dramatic changes. Everybody at this point across every company is like, okay, here's the president. Let's just wait and see. Let's, let's just be logical about it. And there you go. That is my kind of honest opinion. Um, that was by Tourniquet. And he also asked, we all know that Microsoft does most things US first ready. Do you think we'll have any impact to do so? And do you think business as usual or nothing will change? That was in relation to uh, the, the new president question. And I don't think we're going to see any dramatic changes. The company's not going to change just because there's a new president. They're going to adapt. And that adaption takes time. It's not going to be uh, January 20th. That's when the new president gets inaugurated. It's not going to be that date and then everything changes. It's, it's kind of be a wait and see approach to see how things go. <sighs> so um, Spartan fan asks if uh, this is actually a relation to something Paul talked about on another show and he wanted my opinion. He said, um, do you think that the Surface Studio makes sense for Microsoft due to being expensive and being niche product? And does the Surface Hub fit in that category as well? So two, that's kind of two different questions here. Two different questions. Um, does the Surface Studio make sense? I think it does. I, and I think the price point is fine. People are getting really bent out of shape. If you don't need to write on your screen and you don't need the best damn display on the market, the Studio is not for you. Microsoft built a niche product. They were very clear about this, that this is not a mass market device. This is a device. It's a hero device for the, for the category. That's all that it is. And... It's not that while people are going to compare it to an iMac, it's not a quite one to one competitor because it's going after two different markets. Microsoft truly wants to know. Uh, Microsoft truly wants to go after that niche artist creator. That's it. If you're not going to use the screen that if you're not going to use the screen that folds down and draw animations, it's not for you. So I don't think it's a bad product. I think it's going to be a very low volume which is fine microsoft is not dependent on hardware to, to keep the company running that's that's kind of it now granted the uh spartan fan asked would the service hub fit into the same category the service hub is completely different the studio and hub while they're kind of similar are totally different devices surface hub is only sold to enterprise very expensive uh starting at i believe eight grand and the larger one is around twenty two thousand. not cheap machines they're designed to go on a wall we actually looked at them uh potentially putting instead of that TV, putting Surface Hub up there, but sourcing them was uh, quite difficult. Uh, Microsoft didn't make enough of these things and getting actually getting your hands on them is a lot harder than you would think, especially in a short time period like we were. Uh, Service Hub, I honestly think is fine. They're selling out of these things. They can't keep them in stock. So Service Hub, while a niche, the only niche about a thing is that it's for the enterprise. It's for conference rooms. It's for productivity. It's for collaboration. It's for large open spaces. It, it's not the same type of a product. So that's really, I don't know. I, I, I don't think there's a comparison of one-to-one -one between these two things. So we're going to kind of end it here, guys, uh, with the insider tip of the week. I appreciate everybody logging in here. Quite a few, actually. A lot more people logging in today than I thought for a holiday. Uh, it is Veterans Day. Hats off to the veterans. Thanks, guys, for all that you do. Hopefully, you guys, if you are a veteran, you have the day off and you're relaxing and doing all the things that you deserve to do. But anyways, tip of the week. Uh, Clean up your photos. We're heading into the holiday times, and generally there's a lot of photos taken this year. So now's a good time to kind of get yourself organized, figure out what you're going to do, organize them in OneDrive, uh, Dropbox, Box, or whatever service you use. Get your photos organized because you're probably about to take a whole bunch of them when family comes over and just has a really good time on Thanksgiving and Christmas. But that's your insider tip of the week. Organize those photos, guys. And thanks for watching, and I'll catch everybody next week.